let me set this over here. Well, thank you. It's um, fun to do this um, each year when I do it. And it's all Lacey's fault. Once upon a time, when I was in elected office, I served on a board of directors for an organization that Lacey was CEO of called the Association of California Cities in Orange County. And we had a public affairs radio program that we did. She heard about my misspent youth in radio and asked if I would do a radio program for the association. And so we did a public affairs program called the City Square. And we'd bring city managers in, elected officials, people who were in uh, government in some fashion or another, or in private industry that dealt with the city, and we would talk about public affairs issues, and had a couple of different fun features in it. And one year she said to me, would you do a special program for the 4th of July, because our show, the recording of it, was going to land on the 4th of July that year, and I said, yeah, I would, and I put this together, and so this was an hour-long program, she liked it, she made me do it every year, and so I apologize to you in advance, and I'm trying to tailor what is a radio program, which means most of the time I'd be head down reading, to now uh, public speech for you and also uh, conscious of the fact that Lacey wants to record it. So I will, um, I tried to tailor this down. I will try to talk uh, quickly. Um, I'm a former trial lawyer, so I roam. Excuse me if I roam. I made sure I was in her shot when I did it. And we'll, we'll celebrate a little bit the 4th of July, maybe a little different way, talk a little bit about our founders and what they actually went through in order to give us the liberties that we enjoy. So it's one thing to do what we all did yesterday, which was I'm sure celebrate with family and go and watch fireworks. And if you were me, you barbecued and hung out in your backyard with your dog and you had a great time. But um, it's also important that we take a little moment to think about what was going on in 1776, what was happening in our country, what our founders risked and uh, what they took um, as great risks for us. And, and so we'll talk a little bit about the Declaration of Independence and the people who signed it and what was going on in our country at the time, and um, pay some attention to the language, because what they were writing in the Declaration of Independence that Thomas Jefferson penned for them, and that they then debated and edited and modified, was really a revolutionary thought in the day. Nobody in human history had ever before done what this nation did, and that's root its country in an idea. And so we'll talk a little bit about the language. So. Um, let's get off and get started. Uh, we're celebrating 247 years as a nation, which is uh, amazing to me to think about that. 247 years since we signed the Declaration declaring our independence from Great Britain. Uh, it was entitled the Unanimous Declaration of the 13 United States of America. Never before had they called themselves that. They were colonies before that. Um, they called themselves by their colonial names, but not the United States of America it was adopted, as you know, July 4th, 1776 by the Second Continental Congress in a very warm and muggy uh, Philadelphia. That entire week when they were there putting the fine touches on what they had been working on for some time, it was in the high 80s and extraordinarily muggy. So they were very uncomfortable. And they didn't dress like we dress, even when we dress formally. They had very heavy clothing on because that's what they wore in those days. A lot of heavy silk you know, blousing for shirts, these brocade jackets, leggings that they wore, they were not exactly comfortable, right? And they had to do this in Philadelphia in Independence Hall behind closed doors with no windows open, guards at the door. They were plotting sedition against the crown, the most par powerful then country in the world. They, their power then in Great Britain was essentially what our power is today. So imagine what fearsome power we have as a nation militarily and reach around the world. And that's what Great Britain was in the day. I, I tell the story all the time about once having done depositions in San Francisco and we broke for lunch and walked down from the Embarcadero building to the restaurant. We were going to have a quick lunch and then back into the depositions. And we happened to be there during fleet week that were parked out in San Francisco Bay. And a bunch of hotshot Navy fighters decided they were going to fly their F-16s really low over the top of the buildings. And they rumbled the buildings and made a huge amount of noise. And all of us on the street stopped as they did a flyby like they would at a stadium. But when you do that in an urban area, it, it makes a tremendous amount of noise in that canyon. And um, we all stopped in the street and applauded. The Americans just spontaneously applaud our military might and power. It's just a real demonstration of what we can do, right? And I said to my colleagues as we were walking the rest of the way to the restaurant, imagine being somewhere in the desert and having not four of those, but 400 of those, and they're dropping stuff that's blowing up. 
imagine what you'd be doing. I'd be running for the nearest bathroom. So they, they in the day were the great military might that we are today. And these 56 men are sitting in this really stuffy room planning to tell the king to stick it in his ear. And so um, it expresses to the world this declaration, what we regarded as a tyranny against the rights of man. And so I always begin this program by actually reading the declaration. The declaration was signed by 56 delegates. They came from all uh, 13 of the colonies. It was a unanimous vote, not without trepidation to get there. But they um, wrote in this beautiful language. And so um, I, I will not read every word of the declaration just because I'm truncating this for time. In the day, I would read it all. But it's so beautifully written. And, and listen to the language, and particularly a few words that we'll pick up and talk about because they're the essence of what was going on. They didn't um, abuse the English language like we do today. When I first started practicing law in the old days, when dinosaurs roamed the earth, we had secretaries, they weren't called legal assistants then, who typed on typewriters with carbon paper if you needed more than one copy of a contract, right? And in those days, when someone would come in and see you, you spent time getting to know what they were doing and you would write these long letters that sent by snail mail to the other attorney. And I learned over time that the rapidity with which we can communicate is inversely proportional to the quality of that communication. In those days, someone would come in and see me, George come in and see me, say, this is my problem, this is the problem I'm having, and I need you to solve it because Lacey's being unreasonable and you tell me about it. And then I would write this long letter to her lawyer saying, I met with George and this is what he told me and you should consult with your client because these are things we think he violated and that letter would take three days to get to him. He'd read it, talk to his client. They'd be spending days contemplating how to write back. And the discourse was different. Then we got fax machines and you start getting you know, communication that would say, I faxed you an hour ago and I don't have an answer from you. What are your client gonna do? Then we got computers and it went even faster. I emailed you early this morning. I haven't heard from you. Now we get this instantaneous, hey, you jerk, what's your client's answer, right? <laughs> and so the rapidity with which we can communicate is inversely proportional to the quality of it. And, you, and you'll hear the quality of this communication when you hear the declaration written by Jefferson. So let's begin. <clears throat> when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. Listen to that thought for a moment. Then a decent respect for the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to that separation. Most famous part that we all learned as kids. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that men are created equal and that they are, big quotes, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Nobody had ever made that statement before. The way you got your rights was the crown gave them to you or the dictator would, or the emperor if you were Roman, like my ancestors, right? They were entitled by God, by right of descent, to have all power, and they would grant you whatever rights they had. Not what the colonists were saying at the time. They had a completely different view of it. Creator endowed you with inalienable rights, not, not the government. To secure those rights, governments are instituted among men. See the twist? To secure the rights that given to man by their creator, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That's the unique American idea, that the power of the government comes from the governed, not the reverse, that the governed receive their rights from an all-powerful government. Now, I will grant you, as we sit here in 2023 and you look at a lot of what's going on, you may wonder whether or not we've strayed far from that, another subject for a much longer discussion. But that was what was being declared in 1776 in, Ju in July. That whenever, form of government, that whenever a form of government becomes destructive to those ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it or to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their security and happiness. That's the purpose of government in their mind. To secure the rights of the people and to provide for their security and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer when evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of 
abuses and usurpations. Usurpation. They're claiming George has usurped something. He's the crown. What is he usurping? Remember, our rights come from God. He's usurping those rights, right? Pursuing invariably the same object, evidence is a design to reduce them to absolute despotism. It is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such now is a necessity which constrains them to alter their systems of government. The history of the present king of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having the direct ob object of establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove these facts, let the, to prove this, let the facts be submitted to a candid world. And then the authors, Jefferson and the others in the Continental Congress go through a long list of things that he did wrong. I won't read word for word, but I'll give you some sense of them. He has refused his assent to laws. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance. He has refused to pass other laws for large districts of people unless those people would relinquish their representation in the legislature. I'll give you protection, but you have to give up your rights. Right? He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly. He has endeavored to prevent the population of the states from um, passing laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others that allow encouragement of migrations hither. He has obstructed the administration of judgment by refusing to assent to laws establishing judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for their appointment and tenure in office and for the payment of their salaries. He has kept among us at times of peace standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. Imagine today if somebody did that in your country, right? He has affected to render the military independent and superior to the civil power. So his armies that he has encamped in our colonies don't even have to respond to our governors, right? And then they go on and they list a number of other things he's done and then they wrap with these which are important words. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. Remember, the first shots were not in 1776, but 1775 at Concord and Lexington, right? So we were already in an in, in undeclared war with um, the king. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, destroyed the lives of our people. He is at this time, at the writing of this, transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, tyranny, already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy. Wow. You're accusing the most powerful monarch of the most powerful country of perfidious behavior, treasonous. To what? What usurpation and treason? To the natural rights given to you by the creator, over which he has no control over which he's in turning it into a despot situation, taking away the rights of man granted by the creator. Right? Heavy stuff to say to a guy who's got a massive army that can fly those jets over the Embarcadero, right? Or at the time, bring big armies here. Um, he's already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy. Sorry, that's where I left off. Scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages totally unworthy of a head of a civilized nation. Then he goes on, they go on to talk some more about what he has done and say, in every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petition, petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act that may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Nor have we been wanting in attentions to our British brethren we have warned them, warned them from time to time of the attempts by their legislatures to extend unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our emigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured with them the ties of our common kindred to disavow, to disavow these usurpations by the king, right? To disavow these usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They too, have been deaf to the voice of justice and our consanguinity. We must therefore acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace friends. That's to their British cousins, right? We've petitioned you, we've told you about the king, 
you were notwithstanding our consanguinity, you've ignored us, right? So in uh, peace friends, in war enemies, that's what they're saying. We therefore, the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intention. There are several words in here we're gonna come back and talk about in terms of what Thomas Jefferson was doing, but listen to the words he picks, usurpations, unalienable rights, perfidy, right? Rectitude, there's a reason why he's selecting that language and made sure he defended it through a lot of debate over what could or couldn't be pulled in and out of the declaration while the delegates were debating. Anyway, I've lost myself again. Appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do so in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, colonies solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from any allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is outright ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, they have the full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. Final line, which ties it together. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of the divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortune, and our sacred honor. And then it was signed by the 56 men who were there on that day, um, first by John Hancock and a really large signature because he wanted to make sure George could see it without his spectacles. And then he waited for the second person to come up and there was some delay, they, it is reported, between the clerk of the Congress and the chair, Mr. Hancock, or who was gonna come, which and which delegation was gonna, while well, they were having that debate, I want you all to know that if we're arrested at this moment, mine is the only name on this parchment, somebody get up here and take this quill. And so they did, one by one, the 56 men signed it. And I'll read you their names in case you're interested in them. I used to do a lot more than that, but I think it's worthwhile since they risked what they did, and when you hear what they suffered, that we um, name them from Georgia, Burton Gwinnett, Lyman Hall, and George Walton from North Carolina, William Hooper, Joseph Hughes, John Penn from South Carolina, Edward Rutledge, Thomas Hayward, and Thomas Lynch, and, and the fourth, Arthur Middleton. I'll tell you about Arthur Middleton if we have time. Uh, I've got a chance to visit his plantation, something to see. From Massachusetts, one delegate, John Hancock, who was anxious to have other people sign. Maryland, Samuel Chase, William Packer, Thomas Stone, Charles Carroll, Virginia, George White, Richard Henry Lee, Thomas Jefferson, of course, Benjamin Harrison, Thomas Nelson Jr., Francis Lightfoot Lee, Carter Braxton in Pennsylvania, Robert Morris, Benjamin Rush, Benjamin Franklin, John Morton, George Clymer, James Smith, George Taylor, James Wilson, and George Ross from Delaware, Caesar Rodney, who was very, very ill on the edge of death when he signed it the day he signed it. Didn't last much longer. George Reed and Thomas McKean from New York, William Floyd, Philip Livingston, Francis Lewis, Lewis Morton from New Jersey, Richard Stockton, John Witherspoon, Frank Hopkins, Hopkinson, excuse me, John Hart, Abraham Clark from New Hampshire, Josiah Bartlett and William Whipple from Massachusetts, Samuel Adams and John Adams, Robert Shreet, Robert Treat Payne, Elbridge Gary from Rhode Island, Stephen Hopkins, and William Ellerly. Rhode Island, Stephen Hopkins had the funniest line of all. When um, they were signing it, or about to sign it, Benjamin Franklin says, surely we must all hang together, because otherwise we will assuredly hang separately. And uh, at that point, uh, Hopkins jumps up, and he was a portly guy, right? And he said, well, when we hang with my girth, the rope will snap and the neck will go quickly, but some of you will linger and hang for a while. So he was a, he was a funny guy, I like this humor. Samuel Harrington, William Williams, and Oliver Wilcott, and from New Hampshire, the lone Matthew Thornton. So those were the 56 men who signed it. So um, what happened to those 56 signers? Um, it wasn't, as you might think, all um, statues in Statuary Hall in Congress for them. Five of the 56 declaration signers were captured by the British and tortured as traitors. Five of 56. Nine of them fought and died in the American Revolution. 
as actual combatants. Four of the 56 lost their sons in the Continental Army or had sons who were captured. At least a dozen of them had their homes looted and destroyed. The Declaration signer Richard Stockton, a New Jersey Supreme Court justice, returned to his Princeton estate to find that his wife and children were living like refugees, having been betrayed by a Tory who was an American colonist who were loyal to the crown. That's what the Tories were called. A Tory sympathizer who revealed Stockton's location, British troops captured him, threw him in jail where he almost starved to death. When he was finally released and went back to find his estate had been looted and burned, he also found that his family had survived only off of charity. He had been so badly beaten in prison that he died before the war is in. One of the 56. At the Battle of Yorktown in York uh, River, Virginia, Thomas Nelson Jr. had a giant plantation in Yorktown. Had been, um, his, his home had been overrun by General Cornwallis, who had taken over the Nelson home for his headquarters. Nelson urged George Washington to open fire on his own home. This was done and the home was destroyed. Corvallis would later, Cor Cornwallis rather, would later surrender to the British forces at Yorktown in 1781, ending the revolution. But Nelson, one of the brave and 56 signers who had asked for his home to be destroyed, died bankrupt as a result of that. The 56 signers came from various walks of life, but most of them were extraordinarily well educated for their time. They included lawyers, store merchants, farmers, a surveyor, one member of the clergy, and one person who was in communications and um, the media, a guy named Ben Franklin, a printer, had a little newsletter that went out at the time, that later became a newspaper. All knew without a doubt what would happen if they were caught in that room. The um, enemy would consider them a traitor and their life would be over, they would be hung. Still, they signed a declaration that has lasted for these 247 years and is the basis for the greatest nation on earth. So let's talk a little bit about their language that was used because I teased you with some words, right? What is Jefferson doing when he's talking about the whole notion of America? This is a country that's different than anybody other in the history of man. Um, why is it different? Because a king hasn't been handed a right through generations of you know, his family birthright. It hasn't been established as a country by conquest. You didn't have the Romans come in and just take it over and say, okay, you are now part of the Roman Empire. It was being built on an idea. And the idea was that we get our rights from the creator and that those rights are unalienable to us. Interesting story about that word I'll get to if I have time. Um, they're unalienable rights and that no crown, no power, can usurp those rights from us because government gets its right to govern because we, the government, grant it to them. And that has survived for 247 years. No other time in human history has that notion ever survived, that the rights come from the creator, we then grant rights to the government. And if you read the Constitution, which was later formed um, to replace the Articles of Confederation, the Constitution is set up so that there are certain powers granted to the federal government, other powers are reserved to the states, and those things that aren't enumerated in the Constitution to belong to the federal government or to the states belong to whom? To us, the citizens, who derive those rights right from our creator, not from the crown. So sometimes when you hear a government say, my latest regulation says you will not blow off fireworks on July 4th because of the AQMD and air quality, I think to myself, that wouldn't have gone over very well with people who were signing this declaration. They didn't care much about your ideas of regulation, right? So. So those words have power. And Jefferson says, we get our rights from God. They're unalienable. You cannot interfere with them in any way, right? The crown has made repeated usurpations, the attempt to overtake our rights by power, right? In a manner that is perfidious, corrupt, and perfidy. Perfidy in those days was understood to be um, disloyalty. Right? A lack of faithfulness, breaking a bond. You hear sometimes in fancy writing where people talk about a perfidious affair between a man and his lover, right? And being perfidious to his wife. That's what Jefferson and the founders are accusing the crown of. We've come to these colonies, you know our immigration, you know the reasons why, so do our 
brethren of consanguinity, the British people, we've appealed to both of you, and what have you done in response to that? You, by perfidious behavior, usurped our natural rights. Right? So we're dissolving our bonds. Who dissolved their bonds like that, knowing they're going to be end up in war? And, and they ended up in that war. And they talked about the requirement, if you're going to break the political bonds, which you've had with a group of people, to establish a reason, therefore. And that's why the litany of things that they claimed against the crown, because they wanted to appeal to mankind to understand the reasons they would take such a momentous action and the rectitude of their actions, right? The, the justifiable righteousness of it. And it's still, um, amazing to me, having read it a number of times, how well written Jefferson is in expressing what we all take for granted, right? That we have rights we grant to the government. Nobody had ever thought like that before. That wasn't the current state of events. So, so the 13 states were then confederated under the Articles of Confederation, which you all learned when you took civics, um, and they um, established a league of friendship between 13 sovereign and independent states, which didn't work too well over the course of time. Each state retained every power that the Confederation had been um, delegated to the United States. The Articles of Confederation also outlined that Congress would be represented by each state having one vote, not by population. So every colony had one vote. A few years after the Revolutionary War, Madison and Washington were among those who feared the young country was on the brinks of collapse with states retaining considerable power, the central government had insufficient power to regulate commerce. It could not tax and was generally impotent on commercial matters. It could not support a war effort. Congress was attempting to function with a depleted treasury. Paper money from all the different colonies was flooding the country, creating extraordinary inflation. The states were on the brink of economic disaster and the central government had little power to settle quarrels between the states because they had equal powers and they would dispute river waters and where boundaries were and who got what rights and fisheries and imagine in the day the kinds of disputes you could have between various governments of equal power. The states were on the brink of economic disaster and so in May of 1787 a constitutional convention was assembled where in Philadelphia in a hot sweaty room in a muggy summer again where they shuttered the windows of the state house and independence hall, swore secrecy so they could speak freely and by mid-June, the delegates had decided to completely redesign the government, and that, read, that led to our current constitution, which has survived, replaced the Articles of Confederation, and um, new patriots were added to the 56 as they worked on the constitution. They didn't fare much better for all their sacrifice for public service, so let's talk a little bit about them. Of the 39 who uh, walked up to Washington table in the Pennsylvania State House, in September of 1787 to sign the Constitution, 39 signed. Four of them died in 1790, including Benjamin Franklin. <clears throat> Flinty old Roger Sherman, who was a lawyer um, who had earned the singular distinction of being part of the Continental Congress, the Confederation Congress, the Constitutional Convention, and the first U.S. Congress. That's a guy who had long public service. He passed away. The scholarly and nearsighted James Wilson became the first professor of law at the College of Philadelphia in 1790, was appointed by George Washington as one of the six justices of the original Supreme Court. And even though he had only heard nine cases, um, he died in 1798. James Wilson is an interesting character in the signing of the Declaration. And when you read about what happened, he was one of three members of the Pennsylvania delegation. He, a man opposed by the name of Dickinson to having any kind of um, association with the people who were in that room to take on the king. Once he found out they were planning revolt, he didn't want to be there, Dickinson. And then James Wilson, who was a judge, right? Former judge that had been made a member. And so when they were voting, it would have to be unanimous. If any one of them said nay, they would not declare their independence. And so Wilson was sitting there the whole time nervously wondering what Pennsylvania would do because there were differences of opinion in this declaration. 12 of them finally say yes. I'm short to get actually New York hung out a while, but they eventually came in. And then it came down to Pennsylvania. And so Franklin and Dickinson are on opposite sides and it's gonna be up to James Wilson how Pennsylvania will vote. And that's the 13th vote and we either become a free nation or not. James Wilson was not interested in being remembered in history in any way. He just wanted to serve his country. He didn't wanna be the center of power. And so when it came to Pennsylvania, Dickinson jumps up and says, Pennsylvania votes and 
Franklin stops him because he knows where Dickinson is going to go and says, wait, wait, wait. He says, Mr. Chairman, to Hancock, I would like to have the delegation pulled. Dickinson objects and Hancock says, no, he has a right to have the delegation pulled. And so Dickinson says, we vote nay. And Franklin says, we vote yay. And they turn to James Wilson, who didn't want to be the center of attention. He's a judge. He's just sitting there making decisions. And Franklin looks at him and says, well, James, what are you going to do? It's your vote and your vote alone whether we become a free nation or not. People would either remember James Wilson or not remember him. What are you going to do? And James Wilson's desire to remain anonymous was so great that whether or not he wanted us to be an independent nation and tell the king to stick it in his ear, he voted with the crowd because he didn't want his name remembered. Sorry, James. And he was the deciding vote. Interesting fellow. Died after signing the Constitution in 1798, uh, 20 years later. And so it goes on, many, many other deaths that followed. In the end, um, two people who were on the committee to do the declaration, there was a committee, subcommittee of Congress formed for people to start inking together a draft. Thomas Jefferson was drafted to be the Scribner because of his literacy. He was such a great writer and known for that, right? Jefferson was a Renaissance man. I wish I had more time. How am I doing on time? To tell you all the things he could do, but he was a surveyor, a farmer, a lawyer, a brilliant lawyer who James Monroe later clerked for and then became the fifth president of the United States having clerked for Jefferson in his law office. He was a prolific writer. Um, he, he kept almanacs of all kinds. The reason we know what the weather was like in Philadelphia in July of 1776 was he wrote down every day what the weather was like everywhere he was and talked about the humidity and the heat and on the day they actually signed it, it had cooled down to 76 and the humidity had lifted a little bit. Almost like God said, I'll give you some good weather, sign the parchment, right? Mm -hmm. And so there, um, he, he was interesting because they picked him because of his literacy. They picked, uh, obviously, for the same reasons, brilliance and literacy, uh, Benjamin Franklin, and then they picked John Adams, who was a driven, hard charging Massachusetts lawyer who wanted independence. He wanted so much to tell George, I've had enough of you. And he was a little hard charging on every um, debate that they had in the Continental Congress as well. And so those three went and they did this draft of the declaration, which then got amended in the light. And so when it came time for that final vote, Franklin wanted to make sure that that vote was going to include a yay from Pennsylvania since he'd been so intimately involved in it. And so I said, if I had some time, I'd talk a little bit about the language there's a funny exchange that happens between Adams and Jefferson. Adams and Jefferson, by the way, who I'm going to tell you about in a moment, have this interesting sort of friendship, love hatred during their entire political careers. They started out working together on the committee to actually work on putting together the declaration, John Adams, Jefferson, and, um, and, and Benjamin Franklin, who were the subcommittee and then uh, were great allies during the Revolutionary War. Then um, Jefferson served as Adams vice president. They had political differences. They separated. Jefferson started a separate political party, what now is the Republican Party, but then was the Democrat Republican Party. And the um, opposite, the Federalists were John Adams. And so they debated policy and how to do things. And, were um, mortal political enemies for a while, great friends, but mortal political enemies. Then they stopped communicating with one another. And years later, when they became elderly, they started writing to one another. John Adams broke the ice by writing a nice letter wishing Jefferson on his birthday that he had a great longevity. And they started communicating back and forth. And the letters between Adams and Jefferson are not to be missed. If you're dying for something wonderful to read, this kind of great, beautiful language between two men talking about what they had created, right? And so they drifted apart and came back together again. By irony or by happenstance or by fortune, whatever you want to call it, um, or just by coincidence, on July 4th, 1826, which was the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, Adams lay dying in Massachusetts and says as among his last words, at least Jefferson survives. On that 50th anniversary of the Declaration, only two of the 56 men are alive, Adams and Jefferson, who had started out as friends, become political opponents, later became correspondents, and now were the last two survivors of the 56 men who had taken with great 
courage, the timidity to tell the most powerful regime in the world at the time, you'll no longer govern us because of your usurpations of our natural rights, right? And so Adams, concerned about this nation they had birthed, right? 50 years later, having seen it last through the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, great strife and the like, in 1826 says, moments before he dies, um, at least Jefferson still lived. What he didn't know was five hours earlier in Monticello, Jefferson had passed away on the same day. Wow. And Jefferson is reported to have said, at least Adams survived. Oh, so they each thought each other were still alive to continue to shepherd it. Jefferson was 83 and uh, Adams 90. And people wonder, how is it that that happened by happenstance? Some people have opined, just like other elderly people who hang on when they're really, really ill, because they're waiting for a great anniversary, or they're waiting for the birth of a child that they've been waiting to have, a grandchild, or um, they're you know, wanting to see someone accomplish something in their family, and then once that's done, they sigh of relief and let their spirit go. Maybe that's what each of them did, but I always wonder, because my mind is somewhat tortured, what it was like when they both landed up at the pearly gates in front of St. Peter, and each turned to the other and said, you couldn't hang out and continue to work you had to check out and be here. What are you doing here, right? Yeah. You know, the two of them were on the chair. <laughs> so the, um, the government is founded, right? It goes through the Articles of Confederation, which don't serve very well after years. That's scrapped in the Constitution, is signed. And they come out of that same muggy room in Philadelphia. And Franklin, now elderly, is stopped by a woman. and she asked him a famous question. The source of the quotation is um, from James McHenry, who lived from 1753 to 1816 and was a Maryland delegate to the Constitution. McHenry says that as they were walking out, a lady asked Dr. Franklin, well, doctor, have we got a republic or a monarchy? And Franklin responded, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. And that's something that I think we should reflect on, right? They gave us this new nation in 1776. They made it a constitutional republic in 1787. We get to enjoy it. And like we did this morning, thank you for leading it, um, we pledge allegiance to this, the symbol of that republic, right? And we say that in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, right? We're pledging allegiance not just to the cloth, but to what it stands for, the republic that was created as long as we can keep it, according to Franklin. And I think sometimes we take the words of the pledge too much for granted. Right. And years ago, uh, I read a piece, and I always do it at this show. I brought Kleenex, because I never make it through. Lacey's about to laugh, because she knows he can't make it through reading this piece. But I brought a piece that was a part of a speech given by John McCain. Um, I had my political differences with John McCain from time to time. He and I didn't exactly see eye to eye on all policy, but I always respected Senator McCain for his service to our nation, for his heroism during the Vietnam War, to be sure. And this is what he said as an introduction to being called upon to give the pledge one day. <clears throat> Let's see if I can get through this. As you may know, I spent five and one half years as a prisoner during the Vietnam War. In the early years of our imprisonment, the NVA kept us in solitary confinement or two or three to a cell. But in 1971, the NBA moved us from those conditions of isolation into large rooms with as many as 30 to 40 men to a room. This was, as you can imagine, a wonderful change and was a direct result of the efforts of millions of Americans on behalf of a few hundred POWs 10,000 miles from home. One of the men moved into my room was a young man named Mike Christian. Mike came from a small town near Selma, Alabama. He didn't wear a pair of shoes until he was 13 years old. At 17, he enlisted in the U.S. Navy. He later, later earned a commission by going to officer's training school. He then became a naval flight officer and was shot down and captured in 1967. Mike had a deep and keen appreciation of the opportunity this country and our military provided for young people who wanted to work hard and wanted to succeed. As part of the change in treatment, the Vietnamese allowed some prisoners to receive packages from home. In some of those packages were handkerchiefs and scarves and other items of clothing. Mike got himself a bamboo needle. Over a period of a couple of months, he created an American flag that he sewed to the inside of his shirt. Every afternoon before we had a bowl of soup, we would hang Mike's shirt on the wall of the cell and say the Pledge of Allegiance. 
I know the Pledge of Allegiance may not seem like the most important part of our day now, but I can assure you back in that day in that Stark cell, it was indeed the most meaningful event. One day the Vietnamese searched our cell, as they did periodically, and they discovered Mike's shirt with the flag sewn inside, and they removed it. That evening they returned, opened the door, grabbed Mike, took him out, and beat him severely for the next couple of hours so that we could hear his cries. They then opened the door of the cell and threw him in. We cleaned him up as best we could. The cell had <clears throat> bare light bulbs hung in each of the four corners of the room, and we tried, as I said, to clean Mike up as best we could. After the excitement died down, we all got onto the slab in the middle of the room where we would sleep, and I looked in the corner of the room, and there sitting, beneath the dim light of a bulb with a piece of red cloth, his shirt, and another bamboo needle. Sorry. It was my Christian. He was sitting there. He was sitting there with his eyes almost shut from the beating. But he made another American flag. He didn't make it because it made him feel better. He made it because it meant so much to all of us. So when we say the pledge, and we're pledging to the Republic, that those 56 men who gave up their homes, their families, their children, their fortunes, took risks of being captured, tortured, some were, um, gave up everything they had. These were property people, great successes in their communities, right? Who took the giant risk so that we could sit here 247 years later. We should think about Mike Christian and people like him who have served under these colors and remember what Ronald Reagan told us, a great quote that I'll end with. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. Extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on to them to do the same. Or one day we will spend our sunset years telling our children and grandchildren what it was once like to live in the United States when men were free. So we have a huge responsibility that goes beyond the fireworks and the barbecue, right? And my wife, Shani Dew, is in the backyard yesterday as we freshened up our patios. Um, we have the obligation to make sure that we pass it on to the next generation. Some appreciation for those 56 men and for that pledge and for all the people who have served under the flag that represents the republic they gave us, right? At great risk to themselves. So I finish by telling you, some of us are here by the fortune of birth, some because we chose to emigrate here, all because we decided to become Americans and to stay here, right, and to live in the freest country, the greatest country that's ever populated the earth, and the only one built on the idea that our rights don't come from government, but government power comes from the governed. And so that's my story of the 56. I hope you had a wonderful fourth. I'll um, answer questions if you have them, and if I don't know the answer, I will cheat and go to the source, because I brought a copy of the Constitution with me.